Well, hello, my name is Al Meredith. I'm the pastor emeritus here at Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth. We want to welcome you to our weekly podcast. I'm just spending the month of December talking about some of the key people in that first Christmas. Last week, we talked about a girl named Mary. Today, I want to talk about Jesus' earthly father or guardian, Joseph. Let me pray and we'll get started. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the clarity of it. Thank you for the relevance of it, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, I need you to fill me now as I share what God's laid upon my heart from your word in such a way that would penetrate the cold and callous hearts of distracted people with other priorities. Speak your truth through me today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, there was a National Geographic documentary called The March of the Penguins, a study of Antarctic penguins. It is interesting, once the penguins have mated and eggs are hatched, a remarkable phenomenon occurs. Through an intricate dance, each mother passes the chick over to the father. And now all of a sudden, dad is given the responsibility for protecting the chicks from those terrible Antarctic storms. The mothers, each one of them, leave to make a pilgrimage, to gather food and to feed themselves, while dads stand together in community vigils, looking over the little ones and protecting them. The mothers return not four hours after shopping, but four months after feeding. The dads endure four months without food themselves. That's hard to figure. Four months without shelter, facing the bitter blast of those Antarctic storms. And here's the key, all for the protection of their offspring, their little ones. Clearly, the role of father is critical throughout all of creation. And no less is it true, in spite of recent developments, no less is it true for Homo sapiens. We have become a generation which has lost this truth. Sometimes we talk about the highest office in the land, the White House, or perhaps the governor's mansion, in the states. Or maybe the highest office in the land is to be the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, but we're wrong. The highest office of the land, guys, is in your house. It's dad. 70% of all juveniles in state reformatories come from fatherless homes. I want to say that again. 70% of all criminally inclined boys come from homes without a dad. Tonight, 40% of all American children will sleep in fatherless homes. One common denominator for all of our social ills, whether it be poverty or crime or lowering test scores or drugs, one common denominator in all of these social ills is the absence of dad's influence. The FBI studied the 17 kids that have shot their climate, their classmates, rather, in towns like Paducah, Kentucky, Pearl, Mississippi, and Little, Middleton, Colorado. All 17 had one thing in common. They had a father problem. No sense of a loving father's blessing or approval. Bill Glass, who just recently died, an ex-NFL pro bowler, had developed Bill Glass Prison Ministries. And he said, and I quote, if you want to help your kids out of jail... Bless them. Be there for them. Kids join gangs in order to get the sense of family blessing and approval. They'll do anything, even heinous uh, 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 crimes, to belong to a gang that will bless and stand up for them. So when Almighty God decided to send his only son into the world, what kind of man would he choose to play the role of father? Whom would God pick to raise the Messiah? 
the Savior of the world. Let me read to you what little the Bible says about Joseph from Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. His mother Mary was betrothed or engaged to Joseph before they came together. In other words, before they had sexual relations, she was found with child pregnant of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, here he describes him, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, and that's an understatement, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of Davis, fear not to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth the son and shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her, didn't have sexual relations with her until she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now down chapter 2, verse 13. Now when the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, second dream now, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Well, what can we draw? What truths can we draw from this? First of all, I want us today to enter into the idea of what Joseph felt. What Joseph felt. I think it's important that we own that we understand our emotions, not stuff them, not deny them, but understand. I'll tell you one thing I know G- Joseph felt, and he, that's, he felt confused, to say the least. Can you imagine his response when Mary tells him she's pregnant? He said, who have you been sleeping with? No one, Joseph. It was the Holy Spirit that impregnated me. Can you imagine the confusion that caused? Mary pregnant? The Holy Spirit did what? What a mess, Lord. Can you imagine the confusion? Can you imagine the doubts? As in his dream, he is affirmed of what Mary has told him. Was that really God speaking or was it just indigestion? I can imagine the conversation Joseph had with God. Lord, what's the plan here? I'm a carpenter. We always say measure twice and cut once. What's the plan? I'm used to making plans before going to work. And what have you got in store here? I want to ask you, have you ever felt like that? Caught between what God said on the one hand and what makes sense. You finally start to tithe your income. Like you know the Bible has said. And all of a sudden the car breaks down, your wife gets pregnant. God, what is going on here? You sense here in Fort Worth, I know I can't tell you how many people, sense God's call. So you left your home, your job, your family, familiar surroundings for Fort Worth, Texas. And now you can't make your car payments. You're flunking Greek. You're living in a dorm or area of town where dominoes won't even deliver. Or maybe you just rejoice in your children and then they become teenagers and you wonder who's invaded the body of my child. When God just doesn't make sense, it can be confusing to say the least. He felt confused. I want to tell you this, Joseph felt like a failure. Covered with scorn and indignation of his family, his friends, his fellow workers, I can remember the guys at the shop saying, you're not going to marry that girl, are you? Yes. What kind of husband drags his pregnant wife on a five-day journey across Judea? Worse yet, he forgets to make reservations at the inn 
at the busiest time of the year. So he stuffs her into a filthy cow shed where she gives birth to her firstborn child. A cow shed with, I guarantee, bad ventilation, bad lighting, bad smells, bad climate control, just bad news. Joseph must have felt like a complete and total failure. That's important to know because I am convinced the number one need that men have is the need for respect, the need for success. That's why we spend our lives keeping score. Joseph was utterly broken. He had blown it all. All the things a father and a husband should do, he had failed in. Well, he felt like a failure. He felt confused. Even more importantly, what kind of a man was Joseph? What kind of character? Guys, character is foundational actions. We, what we do arrives out of what we are. And so the Bible describes him at least three things that I've noticed. Number one, he was righteous. The first verse we read was that Joseph was a just man, upright, moral, a man who took God and God's word seriously. He feared God. He honored the word. He loved the Lord. Is that the kind of person you are, guys? I remember reading or hearing about boys who were playing on the school grounds at recess. And you know how boys get into this. I can do better than you. Once one boy bragged, my dad, he knows the chief of police. Well, another young boy not wanting to be out there said, well, yeah, well, my dad knows the mayor of the city. Well, the third one, not to be out there, said, well, my dad has met Dad Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. Silence. Finally, one boy proudly spoke up. Well, my dad knows God. Can that be said of you, dads? He was a righteous man. He was a man who knew God. Secondly, he was a compassionate man. In today's world, most pregnant teenage girls are abandoned by their fathers and by their boyfriends, not Joseph. The law, the Jewish law of the day, required stoning for young Mary. A fornicator, the law says. His bitter shame was only balanced by his compassion for this defenseless teenage girl. So in compassion, he planned, as the Bible said, to put her away secretly, to spare her an ignominious and painful death. He was going to put her away while he stayed and remained in Nazareth to, become this, uh, to bear the shame and the scorn of a small town. So he was not only righteous, he was compassionate. Thirdly, he was considerate. It's obvious that Joseph cared for Mary. He tried to look after her needs first. As the boy was born and raised in his home in Nazareth, do you think Joseph sought to teach the boy Jesus some of these same traits? Righteousness, compassion, considerateness. When it came to righteousness, the Bible said about Jesus, he was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet without sin perfect, sinless righteousness. When it comes to compassion and love for others, John 13, 1 said about Jesus and his disciples, he loved them to the end. I would remind you that the 12 apostles were unreliable, unfaithful, unbelieving, yet he loved them to his death. Righteous, compassionate, considerate. Remember on the cross, Jesus' lifeblood was flowing out. He turns to one of the criminals on his side and promises him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And then he turns to his mother Mary, weeping uncontrollably at the foot of the cross, and he points to John with his head because his hands are nailed. He says, woman, behold your son, and he makes arrangements for his mother, knowing he's not going to live out the day. That kind of compassion is rare, especially, I'm sorry to say, among men. In the 1980s, in South Africa's Kruger National Park, the park had more elephants than it could sustain. 
And so park rangers killed off some of the adults and relocated many of the younger ones to another national park, Pylensburg National Park. A few years later, Pylensburg began to experience the unexplained slaughter of its white rhinos. At first, they thought it was poachers trying to get their ivory tusk, but hidden video cameras showed instead that it was hyper-aggressive young bull elephants who would chase the rhinos long distance and then gore them to death with their tusks. This was puzzling to the park rangers because elephants are generally relatively docile and very rarely do they attack other animals. But they found out these orphaned elephants that had been transplanted from Kruger National Park were growing up without any male role models. And so they formed marauding gangs and terrorized the park. What were they going to do? The South African government decided to transfer older bull elephants in <laughs> a grand big brother program. Within weeks, people, the younger elephants began to follow the older one's example and then began to show good behavior, enjoying the presence of their elder role models. Dads, are your children learning godliness from your example? I decided a long, long time ago, long before I was married, long before I even had a girlfriend, that when I did get married, if the God should bless me with children. Like Joshua of old, I was determined. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Years later, my daughter gave me a plaque with that scripture verse on it. It's a choice, guys. But the fate of the world, as well as the fate of your family, depends on that choice. We've talked about what Joseph felt, what Joseph was. Finally, what did Joseph do? Not three points here, just one. Joseph's behavior can be summed up in a single word, obedience. And this is the heart of what I'm trying to say to you today. In verse 24, we read that Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded. In verse 25, Joseph did not have relations with Mary until she brought forth her firstborn son. We read that when the baby was born, Joseph did call his name Jesus, just as he was commanded. And in chapter 2, verse 14, when the wise men come two years later, and they're warned by a dream of Herod's iniquitous plans, Joseph, too, is warned by a dream that Herod wants to kill Jesus. So he packs up his family and descends into Egypt. The principle is this, and for what it's worth, like I tell my students at the history class I teach, this is in red in my notes. The principle is this, the survival of the family depends upon the obedience of the father. I want to say that again. The survival of the family depends upon the obedience of the father. The word of God is filled with illustrations. The children of God are wandering around the wilderness. It's only 11 days journey from Egypt to the land of Canaan. They get to the border at Kadesh Barnea. The 12 spies come back. And other than Joshua and Caleb, they say the land is filled with giants. We are unable to take it. And the disobedience of the fathers led to wandering in the wilderness for the next 38 years until the older generation, over 20, die off. It's a very conservative estimate that for those 40 years, there was one funeral every 20 minutes, 24 hours a day for 40 years. Guys, that's 72 funerals every day because of the disobedience of the fathers. Obedience is so critical in the economy of God. 
The New Testament refers to Jesus as Savior 16 times, but it refers to him as Lord 420 times. Some of you may mistakenly be thinking, well, I believe in Jesus as my Savior, I just haven't surrendered him as Lord. Can't be done. If you would have him as your Savior, you must own him as your Lord. After the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the coming day of judgment. And he says, why do you call me Lord and don't do the things I say? It's an oxymoron. It's not a matter of knowledge. We all know what we ought to do. I'm told 80% of the lawyers in this country haven't drawn up a will. They know they ought to. They just don't do it. Doctors wash their hands less than 50 times between treating patients. They know the experience of germs. They just don't obey. 27% of evangelical pastors do not tithe. I cannot understand that. Mark Twain once said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that give me trouble. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand. And I just don't want to do it. Dads, I want to say again, the health of the family, the survival of the family depends upon the obedience of the father. How's it going? How you doing? One word. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But God finally sought for a man who would play the role of father to the Messiah. He chose Joseph, a simple carpenter from Nazareth. Humble, righteous, compassionate, considerate, and determined to obey God no matter what. Dennis Rainey tells the story of a missionary family were home on furlough and provided with a summer home on a beautiful lake in central Florida. One bright summer morning, mom was in the kitchen fussing with a baby and preparing lunch for the family. Dad was in the boathouse puttering. Three-year-old Billy was playing on the lawn with his five-year-old sister and his 12-year-old cousin. The sister and the cousin wandered off a bit, and so curious Billy decided to walk on the dock and climb into the rowboat there. And as he did so, he fell into the lake. The cousin's scream pierced the air. He had seen it. Dad came running out of the boathouse, dived into the murky water. Too dark, and he couldn't see. Gasping for air, he came up and dived in again and began feeling around for Billy, desperate came up again and, 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 and down back and bumped up against Billy, who'd been holding his breath and clinging to the pylon of the boat, uh, uh, of the dock, holding his breath. He unpried his fingers and carried him to the surface and finally got him coughing and spitting. He said, Billy, what were you doing clinging to that post underwater? And he said, I was just waiting for you, Dad. Just waiting for you. You're my dad. I knew you'd come. The survival of a family depends upon the obedience of the Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, bless us with dads who are compassionate, considerate, righteous, and most of all, obedient for the sake of our families, for the sake of our churches, for the sake of our land. Give us godly fathers like Joseph of old. I pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. God bless.